Hey, it's great to see you today. I know lots of folks are out still for Thanksgiving, but we're glad that you're here. Happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas. I can say it now, right? It's real. It's happening. Evidently, it's all around us. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who helped uh, on Thanksgiving morning. A whole bunch of us were here, I guess hundreds of us, kids, little ones across the board were here helping put together food and all kinds of things for Vickery Meadow. In fact, tomorrow, every child at Jacklow Elementary was going to take home a big bag of imperishable food items for their family in the name of Jesus. And uh, you all helped make that happen. So if you weren't here, um, you're out running turkey trot or something. Yeah, way to go. But that's not all. Because we had a whole crew down at Cornerstone as well, delivering food and uh, for the homeless. I'm just so grateful for those who helped make it happen. Jessica Lambert and Damon Berry and his crew and so many who helped lead out here. And then Larry Richardson continued to bring leadership to that whole deal down at Cornerstone. People like Nancy Rockwell and David, we're so grateful for you guys. I mentioned these people. I can mention a lot. But we, we do this, and it's not just a let, you know, fly in, swoop in, and out. These are partners that we serve with uh, constantly and throughout the year, and you can do so. So we want to, to help you, you, know, help, help you uh, scratch that servant itch that we all have, and you can serve regularly. So, of course, now it is official. You can listen to Christmas music uh, without shame. Now, like 24-7, so have at it. And enjoy. Um, but uh, one of the songs I'm sure that you're going to hear, uh, and probably sing along the way if you're here much, you'll hear it in a mall somewhere probably, is Joy to the World. We thought as a team, we thought, you know, we need a lot more joy in our world. Anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, all right. We need, we need a little more joy. Come on. Okay, so I'm like, yeah, thank you. We need a little more joy. In our world, and and what I discovered was this thing, Joy to the World, written by Isaac Watts, one of the great hymn writers of all time, one of the most beloved Christmas carols, was written 300 years ago this this month, like this season, Um, 300 years ago. And it's kind of an accidental classic. It was actually written as as, as a poem and a book that was about, really about the song. So it's kind of this accidental Christmas song. 1719, that's crazy. But we need a lot more joy in our world. Uh, And we as believers, if you have received Christ, we should be the most joy-filled people on the planet. And we've talked about this lack of joy. We live in this age of anxiety um, where, you know, it's worry, anxiety, and all the comparison and the struggles of this life. Jesus described anxiety as being distracted instead of focused on one thing. The most joyful people on the planet are focused on one thing, and it happens to be Jesus Christ. Christ himself. But those struggles we have, uh, they just become more acute at Christmas time. You know, and the things that make us busy and all of our desires and our, our, our misguided, you know, wants, um, they, they just become more acute at Christmas time, which is why our anxiety and depression often is on the rise at Christmas time. And so we want to confront this with a joy that comes uh, by coming to Christ, uh, the one that, that brings joy into our lives. And today we're going to talk about hope. Because what we discovered, we looked at this um, joy to the world, this great carol, and it offers embedded in it is a pathway to joy. Didn't see this coming. I don't think he wrote it this way, but we, we're, we're going with it. All right. So the first one is to receive your king. We're going to talk about that today. The reception of the king brings great hope. Next week, we're going to talk about peace, prepare him room. We're going to have a very creative uh, service here. Bring the kids. It's going to be a family uh, worship time. You've heard about this, but it's going to be an incredible time here uh, in, in the great hall. We're going to prepare him room. Talk about how do you prepare room for him room in this crazy season. And then uh, heaven and nature sing. We're going to talk about the joy that comes uh, through receiving Christ and all that he brings to us. We'll talk a bit about that today. And then the wonders of his love as we lean towards Christmas Eve. I hope you won't miss a Sunday. We're excited. I love this time of year. But uh, last week we talked about how our hope is fueled by three practices. If you've been with us, we've been in Revelation. So now we're, we're between the, the second coming and his first coming, his first advent or arrival coming. And now we're living in the in-between. And we said that hope is really fueled when we practice certain things. Practicing the presence of God in our lives brings, brings hope. When we, when we uh, really uh, promote others, it brings hope to them and to us. And, and a pattern of repentance, the purging of sin is how we talked about it 
Uh, those things bring hope into our lives. And today I want to delve into this a bit deeper, okay? Because you see, most of us, uh, we, we don't experience true joy because our happiness is actually happenstance. It's based on circumstance. And you know that, right? That, that there's a difference between joy and happiness. Do you ever feel like you lack joy in your life? I think, I think, I think we all do in varying degrees. Do you, do you feel like you lack hope? Maybe you're having a hard time to even know what hope is. I've, and I've wrestled with this. It's hard to nail down. It has this maddening quality like faith. It's in something you don't, can't really see. And hope doesn't have a future orientation. And how does that work? And today I want to talk about how you can apply this message not mine so much as Peter's, the apostle. We're just going to unpack it and draw truth from it. If you will apply this message, what I'm about to share with you, it will change your life. Whatever comes your way, you'll have an unshakable hope. It will mark you as a person. And if you want this kind of life, I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Everybody open your Bible, 1 Peter 1. As we talk about receiving our king, the reception of our king into our lives brings hope. Biblical hope, while you're turning there, is not wishful thinking. It's not crossing your fingers and hoping something will happen. That's what most people think, and that's about all we've got in this world if it's not focused on something outside of this world. All right? It's a, instead a bold expectation that God is going to do what he has said he's going to do. But even there, you're thinking, well, but it's still, it's like, isn't hope like a, in a, a future tense? Someone said it's faith in future tense. And it is that, but it's more than that. And this is what Peter's going to teach us here. See, hope is central to the Christian life. It's why Paul says in Romans 8, for in this hope you were saved. We were now, we're now to live in this hope. It's central to the Christian life. First Peter was written by the Apostle Peter, you probably know that, but it was written to people who were oppressed, people who were being persecuted, and uh, early belief, the first believers, uh, and, and they were being persecuted, oppression, suffering. So if you feel like you're suffering a little bit today, um, this is a word for us. This is all of us in varying degrees. So look at what he says here. I want you to see the, the past, present, and future orientation of hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us, watch the verb tense here, to be born again into a living hope. I like the NIV, into the Greek word ice, more often translated, I think, into a living hope, okay, which is present through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, which is past, already happened, to an inheritance, you see where this is going, that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept, locked up, secured in heaven for you, that's in the future, who by God's power are being guarded, that would be us, by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That is loaded. This teaching is so radical that you only find it in the Christian faith. Let's break this down. If you listen and apply this message, it'll change your life. So if you want to take notes, we're going to talk about a living hope. Notice he calls it a living hope. A living hope. Because what we're going to see is that our hope is possessed in the present. It's purchased in the past and it's presented in the future. First, our hope is possessed in the present. You own it here and now. It should change the way you live. Let's break it down. Blessed, this word is you... Uh, Eulogetto. It's we get the word eulogy. And you know, when you speak well of, that's what it means. To so speak well of, to, to, to bless someone, to celebrate by praising them. Okay? You do this at a at a at a funeral. You know, you don't you don't diss on people. I mean, I learned that. Oh, you don't do that at a funeral. You you bless them, you eulogize them, and, and you you praise them, if you will. But but this is a different kind of praise. It's a focus on the goodness of the one who's being praised. So he says, praise him, bless him. Be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because according to his great mercy, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Because he's withheld his wrath from us, what we deserve. He's withheld that and instead has extended grace to us. Watch this. He has caused us, see the verb tense? He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, he has caused us. He has done this. We have not done this. We, he's caused us to be born again. Now, be clear about this. Again, 
Hope is not wishful thinking. Because if it was wishful thinking, then the strength of your hope would be solely based on the strength of the desire of the one hoping. I'm really hoping. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. Our hope instead is in the one who has made the promise. Our faith is in God and what he has done and accomplished, what he has said, not in ourselves. So he has done this thing. So we have, yes, but if you're tracking with me, and I know you're going, but Jeff, it's still faith. I mean, the faith is such a maddening thing. And hope has the same maddening quality of faith because it's unseen. It's not yet, if you will, and yet we're going to see. No, 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 no. It, it, it has happened. Our hope and our faith is based on something that has happened. Now, when I was a kid, and my mom's here, so she can vouch for this. Christmas Eve, I mean, I have two brothers. We're so hyped that we can't even think straight. But you know why? Because presents are coming, right? If, if you don't think that that something that's going to happen in the future, hope towards something in the future doesn't change the way you live, doesn't bring energy to a life, doesn't make you hyped and live a different kind of life with joy. All you've got to do is show up here on Christmas Eve, particularly our first couple of services, where there are more children than there are parents. And it is tangible. It is. Kids are so hyped, they can't even focus. And I'm all, I always have a great Christmas Eve service. They just can't even focus, right? Because they're so hyped about what's to come. And then we grow up. Then we grow up. I know so many adults who live with very little hope. And I'm not talking about Christmas Eve. I'm talking about life. And it's because, watch this, we place our hope in the horizontal stuff of this world that does this from day to day. No wonder you feel hopeless because you're placing your hope in things that do not last, right? We're born into a living hope. He's done this for us. Watch this. You can't work your way towards it. You can't think your way towards it. I had somebody recently said, Jeff, why is it faith, man? Faith is just hard. Hate faith. You know why we hate faith? Takes you out of control. That's why. You want to be God. Praise God that it's faith. No, faith is tough, man. I don't like faith. Praise him that it's faith. Because you can't be good enough if he's God, if he's holy. You can't be smart enough if he's God. And if we were, we would say, look how smart and good I am. He said, no, I'll take that away as well. It makes us crazy. So how do we live with this hope? Look at what Hebrews 11, 1 says. Clearly define it here. Now, everybody say now. Now, okay, right now. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. But listen, again, it's the object of your faith that makes all the difference. The reason many of us are hopeless is because we're placing our hope in things that do not last. Now, I've referenced this before, but... Um, there was a, a just fascinating story and read. Uh, Victor Frankl was a psychiatrist, neurologist, a doctor who survived uh, the concentration camps, the Holocaust. Um, in fact, he survived Auschwitz. And as a doctor, being a doctor, he was a therapist. People would come to him, and he did this study, then wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. If you want to read the book, it's fascinating. His memoirs, basically, are there. And he writes this book about what he learned about hope in the concentration camp. Fascinating case study. He's walking through it himself. So he started to think, why were some people kind and generous and helpful to others? Why did people go mad? Why did some people kill themselves? Why was it? What distinguished people who had hope? And he said this. He said what he discovered, most people place their hope, and you already know this, in money, okay, stuff they have, posi uh, position in society, our health, or our family, close relationships. Now, think about this. You're thinking, well, I'm not, man, oh, I'm glad I'm not going to be in a concentration camp. Let me ask you this. What is life but each one of those things being stripped away one at a time? The incredible story of Viktor Frankl is that in a concentration camp, all those things are stripped away in a moment. Then what do you hope in? He said, if, you, if your hope, uh, these are my words, but if your hope is only horizontal, 
you're not going to survive. You won't make it. It has to be something that's outside of yourself. Now, he wasn't quite as Christocentric here as Peter is or as I am, as we are. But our hope is found in something outside of us. Watch this. Someone outside of us. And the stripping away of these things we place our hope in is actually a terrifying grace. And if you live long enough, you experience it. Never place your hope in something that will not last. In fact, I could say the anxiety, the worry, the fear that you have in your life, you name it, isolate it, focus on it. It's because you're placing your hope in something that will not last. This is such a key learning for the believer. Perhaps you're feeling hopeless today. And I want to encourage you. Because here's the thing. If you're hopeless, you need to know this. The gateway to hope is hopelessness. When you give up on all the things that you're placing your hope in, the horizontal hopes that you've placed your hope in, when you give up on that, you're beginning now to move towards a life of hope and peace and joy. And when you get to that gateway, when you get to the door, you'll open it. A hopeless person, and you know who's standing there. It's Jesus, who says, come to me. Come to me. I will give you peace. Come to me if you're hurting, if you're anxious, if you're worried. I'll give you hope to live for. Hope is placing your trust in him. So our hope is, is possessed in the future. Our hope is purchased in the past. And our hope is presented in the future. All right? So these are, these are the four things I want us to see. But what happens is necessity finds them out. So let's, let's go back to our hope is purchased in the past. Because this is so important to understand. 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and here it goes. We've already read this. So through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You say, well, Jeff, there you go again. That's something in the past. Makes us crazy. You're telling me I've got to have faith in something that happened in the past. Yes, and you do it all the time. You do it all the time. He says we've been born into this living hope. Here's the thing. You weren't around. Well, you were around. You were around. You don't remember when you were born. You didn't have a will to be born. Someone else willed you into existence. Someone else caused you to be born again or born the first time. But here's the deal. You know you were born. Why? Because you're alive. That's why. You're here. You know you've been born again if you are alive to him. You say, well, wait, what what, what does that look like? You desire him. You want more of him. You can't wait to be among his people. You want to worship him. You want to serve others. You want to grow in him. I would say you want to covenant with God's people. You love being around God's people. You can't wait to be with God's people. If that's not true of you, Sorry, not sorry. I would question your salvation. What's your prayer life like? Do you love his word? Are you in it? Are you growing? Do you want to be like him? See, but Jeff, this stuff is hard, man. Faith in something of the past. Listen, long before Christ came, 400 prophecies out of the Old Testament pointed to him. The odds are astronomical that that would happen for one person. And then we see key facts outside of the biblical material. He lived. We know he lived. I'm talking about Roman documents, historical documents. We know that he died uh, capital punishment under Pontius Pilate. We know this outside of the Bible. We know that his followers saw him, believed to have seen him after he rose from the dead. Well, that didn't mean it happened. Right? And that, I mean, they claimed to have seen him. And then they worshipped him as God. All of that outside the Bible. And so I'm, I'm just saying there are barriers to faith, but those things are broken down. In fact, your faith, your hope is living proof that he resides in you. That he is alive. First, or 2 Corinthians 1.22 says this. It says that he has put a seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. How do you know you're saved? Because his yes is implanted within you. Like, yes, I know that he is, he, he's my savior. I know that I believe. 
And, and you can have hope in the present because it's purchased for you in the past. And watch this, finally, lastly. Our hope is presented in the future. It's fully realized in the future. Look at what he says in verse 4. To an inheritance. Now, you catch the language, right? The imagery that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded. We're being guarded through faith, not our works. We can't lose our salvation because it's not based on what we've done. For, for he, it's faith in our salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There's an inheritance with your name on it. And it's going to be revealed in the last time. So what do we do here? How do we apply this as we close? Well, three things. First, rejoice with hope. You say, how do we apply this? Peter would say, keep reading. Oh, okay, okay. Here we go, verse 6. In this, okay, what is this? In this resurrection, Christ resurrection, you rejoice. Though now for a little while, here's real life. If necessary, that is to say, though you will, and there's purpose in it, you have been grieved by various trials. This is the amazing thing about this text. Listen, don't miss this. Being a believer, this living hope forever changes the relationship between joy and suffering. Most people, most of us live this way. Well, I went through a season of suffering. Man, it was tough. It was really hard. But now I'm happy. I'm good now. Joyful. Uh, yeah, we'll wait till tomorrow. What happens here, only in the Christian faith, only with this living hope, you go through trial and suffering, and at the same time, you're joyful. Why? Because our joy is not based on circumstance. It's based on what Christ has already accomplished for us and what he promises for us. This is a radical way to live. But many of us, for many of us, our joy is circumstantial. Why? Because our joy is a circumstance. Friends, I'm telling you, that's no way to live. Have you figured that out yet? It's only in placing your faith in Christ will you experience this hope. So we rejoice with hope. We persevere with hope. Look at verse 7. We go through trials so that the testing genuineness of your faith more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Think about this. Two people. One, uh, they have the same job. Menial job, working away. It's a beat down. They have no benefits. They're there all the time, every day. One person making 30000 a year. The other person is making $30 million a year. One of them skipping to work every day. One of them is whistling while they work. The other, it's a beat down. They can hardly make it through the day. Why? The only difference is the perspective on what they will receive, right? Perseverance in trial proves that your faith is genuine. People walk through trial and we often think, oh, yeah, they went through a hard time and they just lost their faith. No, 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 no. No, the trial revealed where they placed their faith. It was taken away. They didn't know what to do. And so, friends, this living hope, here's the last word I want to bring, worship with hope. Live with hope. As the band comes up, we're going to sing a song together as we close. Verse 8, watch this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. This is superlative language. You rejoice with joy. Joy and more joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hold on, friends, because what is coming is secured and it is happening. It's coming. But watch this. Don't miss this. In, in Proverbs 13, 12, it says, hope deferred, that is hope put off, hope put off to another time, makes the heart sick. Don't wait. Don't put it off because there is a decision to be made. You place your hope in Christ and you will experience the joy that comes with knowing him because our hope is possessed in the present. It's purchased in the past and it's presented in the future. This is the Christian life and it changes the way we live in the here and now. And in the end, See, hope has a name. Jesus Christ, our living hope. 
It's why Paul says in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory.